how did we invent electricity and is it possible to get it entirely for free? My name is Valentina and welcome to my life without plastic. Well, hello, hello everyone. Welcome back. Long time no see. I disappeared for like two weeks. Just, you know, I needed some time to get my life back together. I don't know why I thought it would be a good idea to have a podcast on top of my full-time job, but here we are. <laughs> anyway, October 10 was mental health day and instead I pretty much decided to take two weeks for mental health. <laughs> I feel like everyone needs that every once in a while, especially with everything happening in the world right now. We all deserve some time off. So I gave myself some time off. I hope you didn't miss me too much. But honestly, I feel so much more recharged and ready to share everything with you. And this is exactly what I'm planning to do today. I think partially the reason I delayed this episode was also because this topic specifically did take a bit of, you know, longer research. And I mean, I really went deep into the rabbit hole with this one. Like, <laughs> you're gonna see, I was searching for that conspiracy and boy, did I find it. But of course, the best comes last. So for now, we're first going to have to focus on the facts. And you're going to have to wait until the end of the episode to hear all about that conspiracy tea. And it's so juicy and spicy. You're going to love it. But what's today's topic? I should start with that, right? Well, today we're going to take a look at energy. Specifically, we're going to explore how we invented electricity, where are we really going with the whole solar energy deal because obviously this is what everyone's talking about of course we're gonna take a look at how electricity impacts the environment and last but not least like i mentioned i've got some juicy and spicy conspiracy to spill so definitely stay tuned until the end we're gonna be taking a look at if it's actually possible for everyone and i mean every person on this world to get free energy forever well you're gonna have to stay tuned until the end or pretty much skip until the end to find that out but first we need to talk about the whole background so let's see where everything started how it developed and of course where we at right now right so we're gonna be going into a very very brief history lesson to take a look at how everything evolved concerning energy. So the very first energy source was obviously the sun, right? Like you can imagine from the beginning of time, the sun has been there to provide heat and light during the day. And later, as humans obviously evolved, um, they also discovered fire, right? Which was discovered basically by lightning strike producing another source of heat and light. So now we've got sun and also fire. And thousands of years later, we also discovered that wind could be harnessed. And then, you know, obviously we began to use sails on our boats for transportation and so on. So after this, we began to use windmills to turn water wheels for grinding grains. Throughout history, we have made lots of discoveries using energy. But let's take a look at where it all began. How have previous civilizations actually harnessed electricity in specific, right? Well, to the best of our knowledge, the Greeks were the first to discover the notion of electrical charge over 2,600 years ago. So when we talk about energy and electricity, like it, sometimes it sounds pretty recent, but really it's existed for quite a while. So what the Greeks observed was they observed that rubbing fossilized uh, tree raisin or amber with animal fur caused it to attract dried 
grass. Essentially, the Greeks had come across static electricity. We also know from ancient texts that Egyptians knew that some species of electric fish could trigger shocks in the body. In fact, the ancient Egyptians likely used the electric Nile catfish to treat headaches and nerve pain, a practice that remained in medical use until the late 1600s. Can you imagine that? Such an old, I guess, like one of those um, practices that are passed down generations and it just never dies out. There's always, you know, it just, everyone continues to believe that it works. And I mean, if they continued using it, apparently it didn't work for them. Then natural gas was used as early as 500 BC by the Chinese. They would find natural gas leaking from the ground and use bamboo to pipe the gas for use in everyday tasks such as boiling seawater to remove the salt. Which is something that's very smart. Like it's, it's incredible that we can see traces of, of this happening 500 BC. That's just amazing to me. And, you know, without a doubt, the most amazing example of electricity in antiquity is the Baghdad battery. And at first I was a little confused what it was all about. So I made sure to really look into exactly the structure of it and what it entailed, why it was so important, why it's also such an important and amazing example of electricity being used in very old uh, societies. So this um, particular instrument was discovered by the expedition led by Dr. Wilhelm Koenig um, of the Iraq Museum in Baghdad in 1936, and the finding consisted of a vase made of clay. At first, you know, just looks like a simple vase, but obviously it wouldn't be mentioned in this podcast it was, if it was just a simple vase. So dating suggests that the artifact is about 2,000 years old, from the 1st century AD, during a time when the region was occupied by the Parthian Empire. Although its appearance didn't seem out of the ordinary, scientists quickly learned that there was so much more to that small clay pot once they peeked inside. The vase contains a hollow cylinder made of a sheet of copper of high purity. The lower end of the cylinder was covered with a piece of sheet copper, while the inner bottom of the cylinder was covered with a layer of asphalt, only 3 millimeters thick. The upper end of the cylinder was plugged by a heavy and thick layer of asphalt. The center of the plug featured a solid piece of iron. And if you're tuning in from Spotify or not a podcast platform, you can check out my blog to um, see this vase that I'm describing and to see what it looks like. But let me continue. Like, why is this vase so important? Well, at the time of discovery, Kuning uh, recognized that the jar and its odd metal structure were in configuration that suggested it could have functioned as a wet cell battery. In fact, it seems to have served no other purpose than that of generating a weak electric current. And experiments conducted with replicas of the jar employing various acids found that the mixture of acetic acid, which is um, distilled vinegar basically, and grapefruit juice generated 0.5 volts of s for several days. So, you know, okay, like now we know that this vase potentially was used to generate some sort of electricity, but what purpose could the ancient battery have served considering that no motors, lights, or any similar electric device have been found? Well, one possible application of the battery, uh, the Baghdad battery, is for medical therapy. Just like the Greeks and Romans of the time routinely employed the common electricity ray to deliver electric shocks to patients for treating pain. So this could have been just another device um, similar to, to those, um, you know, pain treatment devices used at the time. So we can definitely see some hints of harvesting um, electricity in ancient societies. But in more modern times, before 1850, 
really all we see is really wood, straw and dried dung that was basically our main source of fuel for heating, cooking, producing steam, for powering steam engines um, and so on. So in the in the past, um, as we look at history, we can see little hints of different alternative kinds of electricity being used. But once we start looking closer at 1850 to now, we can already see that certain industries have taken over that entire sector. So from 1850 to 1945, coal was the main fuel source. Uh, wood was still an important energy source for heating as well as natural gas for lighting, but water and wind were used less. And the world's first integrated national grid opened in 1935 in the UK. Rather than having a, a host of small power stations, just seven grid areas were created to cover the United, United Kingdom. From about 1945 to the present, Nuclear and solar energy, along with water and wind, have played a larger role in the production of energy. And other alternative energy sources being used today are also geothermal and biomass, which we're going to touch base in a little bit when we look in more details um, in the, you know, what the different energy sources are. But just wanted to cover briefly what the history of electricity looked like. Um, and the world's first wind farm opened in New Hampshire in 1980. So this is just a very, very brief glimpse of how energy has evolved throughout time and how, you know, the human population has learned to harvest it. In some ways, we've come full circle, if you think about it, when it comes to energy. Ironically, the first sources of energy were the sun and wind. And here we are again, looking at those and trying to, you know, find again this harmony, this balance with nature by using renewable sources. But now that we know the history of energy and how electricity has been used throughout time, let's take a quick look at what exactly is electricity so that we can understand where what areas we can improve on and where we can do better right so many have been taught in elementary school that benjamin franklin discovered electricity by tying a key to a kite while standing in a thunderstorm however this is not entirely true for the purposes of time i'm not gonna go into too many details here but let's just say that Franklin wasn't the first scientist to study charged particles, nor did he ever set out to discover electricity. His investigations merely sought to demonstrate that lightning was a form of static electricity. So basically, he was hypothesizing that lightning was a massive electric spark and proposed an experiment with an elevated rod to draw down the electric fire from the cloud. Word of Franklin's theories uh, reached Europe where Frenchman Thomas Francois d'Alembert, or however his name is pronounced it, um, and later also Englishman John Canton, also Russian chemist Mikhail Lomonosov, all already conducted uh, and successfully replicated this experiment. Franklin was apparently unaware that others had already conducted the experiment, which is very likely for the time, if you think about it, you know, how long communication took to reach different countries. But anyway, let's assume it was Franklin for uh, just the purposes of this episode, but I really found it interesting that there were so many other people doing the same thing at that time that just, I just wanted to bring it up that it's not, an, you know, a fact that he discovered electricity because at the same timeline, other scientists worldwide were testing the same experiment. But anyway, how did we go from hunting for electricity with a kite to modern day electricity, right? Well, in 1878, American inventor Thomas Edison unveiled the first practical light bulb that could generate light for hours on end. Later, in the late 1800s, Serbian-American inventor Nikola Tesla pioneered work the 
induction motor uh, among other inventions obviously but the induction motor is one of the most important inventions in modern history today not only do the machines turn on the lights in your home but also power many mechanical gadgets people take for granted from vacuum cleaners to electric toothbrushes to the very classy tesla motors model s so Electricity was definitely essential in making some big technological advances in modern history. So obviously, a lot of things that we take for granted today have been made possible thanks to electricity and, you know, the the developments and innovations we've um, created in that sector. So how exactly is electricity made today, right? Like, again, like it's contributed to the invention of so many different things that we take for granted. But how exactly do we make it happen? Obviously, we're not using a kite to to draw lightning, that's for sure. But um, in the United States, we use many different energy sources and technologies to generate electricity. The sources and technologies have changed over time, obviously, and some are used more than others. The three major categories of energy for electricity generation are fossil fuels, which include coal, natural gas, and petroleum. There's also nuclear energy and also renewable energy sources. Fossil fuels are the largest source of energy for electricity generation. Um, Again, fossil fuel consists of coal, natural gas, and petroleum. So natural gas was actually the largest source, about 38% of U.S. electricity generation in 2019. Coal was the second largest energy source for the U.S. electricity generation, again in 2019, with about 23% domination. And um, then after that, we have nuclear energy which provides one-fifth of u.s electricity so that means about 20 percent of u.s electricity comes from nuclear energy in 2019 and lastly renewable energy provides an increasing share of u.s electricity but as of 2019 it's still at about 17 percent from the total electricity generation in the united states So now, um, looking at this, how does electricity really impact the environment? Obviously, a big chunk of it does not come, it's not produced from renewable resources. Well, although electricity is a clean and relatively safe form of energy when it is used, the generation and transmission of electricity definitely affects the environment. Um, Nearly all types of electric power plants have an effect on the environment, but some power plants have larger effects than others, right? Um, The United States has laws that govern the the effects that electricity generation and transmission have on environment. For example, there is the Clean Air Act, uh, which regulates air pollutant emissions for most power plants. Uh, The United States Environmental Protection Agency administers the Clean Air Act and sets emission standards uh, for power plants through various programs, such as the ACID Rain Program. The Clean Air Act has helped to definitely substantially reduce emissions of some major air pollutants in the United States. But now let's take a, 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 a more detailed look into exactly how is the environment impacted. Uh, Like I mentioned before, in the United States, about 65% of total electricity generation um, was produced from fossil fuels, which again include coal, natural gas, and petroleum. Materials that come from plants, which are biomass, and uh, also industrial waste, so burning waste. The substances that occur in combustion gases when these fuels are burnt include, of course, greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is the one that probably almost everyone's familiar with, um, which contributes to the greenhouse effect. There's also sulfur dioxide, SO2, which causes acid rain, um, which is obviously harmful to plants and to animals um, that live in the water. 
SO2 also worsens respiratory illnesses and heart diseases, particularly in children and the elderly. There is also nitrogen oxides, NOx, uh, that contribute to ground level ozones, uh, which irritates and damages the lungs. Uh, there's also particular matter, also known as PM, which results in hazy conditions in cities, uh, scenic areas, and coupled with ozone contributes to asthma and chronic bronchitis, especially in children and the elderly. Very small or fine PM is also believed to cause emphysema and lung cancer. Um, also, there, we can also find heavy metals in that combustion, right? Um, heavy metals such as mercury are hazardous to human and animal health. So obviously, in general, uh, burning fossil fuels is harmful. Like there's no need for me to dwell on it and and you know give you all these like crazy chemical names. It is end of you know like in the end of the day, it is harmful. That's the bottom line. It's harmful not just for the environment. It's harm you know for the plants, for example, but it's also harmful for people. Um, animals and so on so after that after fossil fuels we're also looking at um, not just gases that are produced but also there's liquid and solid waste so ash is the solid residue that results from burning solid fuels such as coal uh, biomass and also solid waste. So the ash contains all the hazardous materials that pollution control devices capture. And many coal-fired power plants store ash, um, it's called ash sludge, which basically is ash mixed with water, in retention ponds. And several of these ponds have uh, burst and caused extensive damage and pollution uh, downstream. Some coal-fired power plants send ash for use in making concrete blocks or asphalt. So again, electricity produced through fossil fuels. Not only um, can we see greenhouse gases there and other harmful particles to the environment, humans and animals, but there's also liquid and solid waste that further pollutes our planet. Next, we also have got the nuclear power plants, uh, which produce a different kind of waste, right? So you're going to see in a, in a little bit when we talk about uh, nuclear power that it's not necessarily bad for the environment because um, power plants do not produce greenhouse gases or PM or SO2, NOx, all of these things. They do produce, however, two general types of radioactive waste. There is low-level waste, such as contaminated protective shoe covers, clothing, wiping racks, mops, filters, reactor water treatment residues, equipment, tools. All of this is stored at nuclear power plants until the re radioactivity in the waste decays to a level safe for disposal as ordinary trash. Or it is sent to a low-level radioactive waste disposal site. High-level waste, on the other hand, includes highly radioactive spent uh, nuclear fuel assemblies, which must be stored in specifically designated storage containers and facilities. So obviously, in this case, we're not talking about greenhouse gases, we're talking about radioactive waste, which is a different kind of waste. Um, this is why when we look at clean energy or green energy sometimes nuclear power is also included because technically it doesn't pollute the air but of course it provides a different kind of danger um we also have to consider something else that i feel like oftentimes slips our mind electric power lines and other distribution infrastructure also have a footprint right so when we talk about um, electricity and its impact on the environment we're not really only talking about fossil fuels and greenhouse gases and waste we're also we also need to take a look at the actual uh, infrastructure and dis distribution of electricity right electricity and transmission lines and the distribution infrastructure that carries uh, carries electricity from power plants to customers also have environmental effects 
Most transmission lines are above ground on large towers. The towers and the power lines alter the visual landscape for one, um, you know, especially when they pass through undeveloped areas. So vegetation near power lines may be disturbed and may have to be continually managed to keep it away from power lines. Um, so these activities can affect native plant populations and wildlife, of course, consequently. Power lines can be placed underground, but it is uh, more expensive, obviously, and usually not done outside of urban areas. So this update was actually from December 2019 as to how um, this, the distribution of electricity can impact landscape and the environment. Um, and like I always say, everything we do has consequences. And we just need to be mindful of them. Uh, you know, when we talk about the impact of dirty or like bad electricity um, on the environment, we sometimes tend to forget that it's not just about the greenhouse gases and, and, and the waste. It's also about, you know, the transmission and distribution of electricity. So how do we actually go about installing those power lines in a cleaner way, right? And talking about a cleaner way, uh, this is a perfect way to transition to clean energy. <laughs> so obviously, the whole purpose here is to explore clean energy. The environmental impacts of what we consider traditional, or some people call it dirty ways of producing electricity are pretty bad. And um, this is why we see such a big movement towards the renewable energy sector but, but you know it's funny again it's nothing innovative it's really us going full circle back to our origins and the way we first started experimenting with electricity <laughs> but you know what is considered clean energy let's take a look at the different clean energy sources well we've got solar no need to explain there Everyone, I feel like this is the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about clean energy. There's obviously wind, um, another very popular clean energy, uh, you know, like method. So again, no need to dwell on it further. There's also water. So basically, um, we can deploy clean domestic power generation from hydropower, waves and tides. Um, there's also talk of geothermal, which geothermal energy is heat energy from the earth. There's also bioenergy. Bioenergy is renewable energy made available from materials derived from biological sources. Biomass is any organic material which has stored sunlight in the form of chemical energy. There's also the nuclear power, uh, obviously the use of sustained nuclear fission to generate heat and electricity uh, provides around 6% of the world's electricity today. Uh, but again, nuclear electricity, electricity created in nuclear power, through nuclear power can be considered clean. But as I mentioned, there are other types of waste um, that we need to consider when we talk about nuclear power. And there's also hydrogen and fuel cells. Fuel cells offer a highly efficient and fuel flexible technology that cleanly produces power and heat with low or zero emissions. All right, so there's so many sources, right? Like I just wanted to bring it up because it's not just the sun. It's not just solar energy. There's different sources, renewable sources that can be used to produce clean energy. So, you know, I was very interested in finding out how exactly does it work? Like, how do we use renewable resources to produce energy? And I read something very interesting. I really never thought about it. It's, you know, it's one of those things that it's so obvious. Like, it's literally right in front of your face to the point that you just simply overlook it. And I feel like this is exactly what it is. Well, what I found out is that the United States electric grid is basically like a bathtub. So picture a bathtub. 
And each time you use electricity, you drain a little bit of water from that tub. Makes sense, right? So each household, each household, whenever they use electricity, we all drain a little bit from that common bathtub that we share. And, you know, water comes into the tub from any kind of source. So it could be clean or dirty, right? It could be renewable energy or it also could be fossil fuels. Um, as demand for renewable energy increases, more clean water goes into the tub. And obviously less dirty water is needed to keep the tub full. Essentially, renewable energy does not go directly to your home. It's added to the grid on your behalf. And this is um, something that I feel like it's very important to understand. I was a little bit confused, to be honest, by this, because my expectation was that if you have solar panels, then your home should technically be considered using green or clean energy, right? Or however you want to call it. But I did some more research and it turns out majority of solar powered homes do not have a battery backup system and are still connected to the power grid. And this obviously serves different purposes. On the one hand, you know, this is what they call net metering and this is how it works. When solar panels produce electricity, it flows into the grid and the production is monitored and credited to the homeowner's account. So in some cases, this is when homeowners will notice the meter will roll backward. So if your household has solar panels and solar panels generate more electricity than what your household uses, then this electricity would like basically um, your meter will roll backward and you'll be credited for that electricity because you've basically given it to the grid. But when you have solar panels, it's not that solar panels power your home directly and then any leftover stored energy is sold to the grid. No, solar panels power the grid and then from the grid, your household uses that energy. And if your solar panels have put in more energy into the grid than what your household has taken out, then you would be credited for it. And obviously vice versa in some cases, if you live, let's say, in a place where you, your solar panels don't get enough charge, um, this is also when you would use partially solar energy and then also partially more energy, additional energy from the grid so that you don't stay without power. So this is one of the reasons they say solar energy should be flowing through the grid so that if your solar panels are not enough to keep your household, um, you know, powered at all times, then the grid will take over and provide the additional power needed. But it also means that renewable energy doesn't go directly to your home. It's added to the grid on your behalf. I was just mind blown to really, you know, find that out. I thought that was so interesting. Obviously, as a homeowner, you have the power to make an investment in renewable energy. But let's be honest, this is not something that an average person can afford, even if they wanted to. So I think it's definitely something to consider. Obviously, um, it does depend on more people providing renewable energy into the grid but in the end of the day it also kind of takes away the decision and the choice we've made right because our energy essentially still goes through the grid and essentially we're just given what like a mix of what's flown into as i call it a bathtub right we're just given a mix of what's flown into that grid but when looking at a bigger scale of this movement, um, and don't just consider homeowners, but start looking at businesses and governments, obviously they also have an impact of what kind of energy flows into the grid, right? Um, and how they go about their plans to move to a more sustainable energy source. I've actually stumbled upon 
two terms that I also wanted to kind of clarify here real quick. Um, there's the talk of net zero and zero carbon electricity. So sometimes those can get confusing because they sound very similar. You know, net zero, zero carbon. What's the difference and why does it matter? Well, in order to halt the effects of climate change, a number of countries are committing to a net zero emission economy. This means that any carbon emission created are balanced or kind of cancelled out by taking the same amount out of the atmosphere. So this does not mean no emissions at all. This is why it's called net zero, meaning that there is a give and take at some point and eventually this impact um you know, th this impact is cancelled out or balanced out by other actions that are taken. And the fact is that 100% renewable energy does not equal to 100% carbon-free energy. And this is largely due to the limitation on technology among many other challenges. But it's very important to understand, when we talk about clean energy, when we talk about renewable energy, this does not mean that we are going zero carbon. It doesn't mean that just because we're using a renewable energy source, we're not producing any carbon emissions at all. Some of these challenges include the amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted during both the manufacturing of the materials for power grids and the installation of power grid systems. Um, and obviously also the lack of renewable energy storage solutions that has led to non-renewable energy needing to be mixed in with clean energy to support the demand of electricity. Again, this refers back to that bathtub scenario of how clean and dirty water or electricity flows into it and everyone kind of shares whatever's in that tub, um, regardless of where it came from. So again, just like I've mentioned in previous episode, just because something seems to be good for the environment doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% good. All of our actions have consequences and it's just, you know, some have less impact on the environment than others. Um, but we shouldn't go blindly about choosing what we want to do. Because essentially everything we do will have some sort of consequences. And it's really important to understand that. I think that it's a very important first step, first step to understand that everything we do has consequences. And to be aware of those consequences, this is how we can be aware of our own footprint. Not just to think that simply because we've opted in to use renewable energy now all of a sudden we're doing the best thing for the environment obviously using renewable energy is so much better for the environment than using fossil fuels and so on but it doesn't mean that we don't impact the environment at all and this is just something that we really need to keep in mind um, and not just blindly go into uh, you know like supporting everything that seems to be good. We always need to do that extra research and see what's on the other side. Is there anything speaking against it? And obviously, this is the perfect transition to my favorite segment of the episode, spilling the conspiracy tea. <laughs> we finally arrived to it and I'm so happy. Because today's conspiracy tea is very, very interesting. And we're going to talk about free energy. Does it exist? If, obviously, if you're into conspiracy theories, you probably believe that it does. So for you, the question would be, who is hiding it from us? And how can we get it, right? Well, the conspiracy theory is called the free energy suppression or also known as new energy suppression 
it's a conspiracy theory that technologically viable, pollution-free, no-cost energy sources are being suppressed by government, corporations, or advocacy groups. So I'm going to repeat that again because those are some fancy terms that take a little bit to process. We're talking about technologically viable, pollution-free, no-cost energy. Doesn't this sound amazing, like, for free? And also it's good for the environment? I mean, what could be better than this? Well, devices allegedly suppressed include perpetual motion machines, cold fusion generation generators, torus-based generators, reverse-engineered extraterrestrial technology, anti-gravity propulsion systems, and other generally unproven low-cost energy sources. Um, you know, the alleged... I'm going to go into details on all of these, but like, let me just summarize a little more um, about the overview of this theory. So the alleged suppression or weakening is claimed to have occurred since the mid-19th century and allegedly uh, perpetrated by various government agencies, corporations, um, and special interest groups, also fraudulent investors. So the special interest groups are usually claimed to be associated with fossil fuel or nuclear industry, whose business model would be obviously threatened. So claims of suppression include, one, the claim that the scientific community has controlled and suppressed research into alternative avenues of energy generation via the institutions of peer review and academic pressure. The claim that the sec second, uh, the claim that devices exist which are capable of extracting significant and usable power from pre-existing unconventional energy reservoirs, such as the quantum vacuum zero point energy, for little or no cost, but are being suppressed. And third, the claim that related patents have been bought up, such as those for 100 MPG carburetors. Not sure what exactly that is. <laughs> but I mean, to be honest, I really fell down the rabbit hole on this one. I mean, think about it. What if there is a reverse engineered extraterrestrial technology? Can you imagine? I mean, I feel like everything else mentioned on that list probably exists just because I feel like, um, you know, it sounds like it could already be possible if you just think about it. I know it's two separate things, but if we are able to use technology to send people in space to live there for several months, how don't we have the capability to produce free energy for all with any kind of technology? I just feel like it's a little bit sketchy, but I definitely found the extraterrestrial technology very intriguing. Um, you know, that would be something really cool if we had that. But um, something else that I found that was sketchy <laughs> was this website that actually had an entire analysis on this theory. Obviously, it was one-sided and it was just like trying to prove that the theory is, is true. Um, it didn't provide any counter, you know, counterpoints to, the, to, to that theory. So not the most credible. But I found it very interesting to like see their perspective. So according to that site, many free energy claims, such as extracting zero-point energy, are demonstrably impossible under modern science. And this is basically um, the main reason used, right? Conspiracy advocates claim that the scientific community has controlled and suppressed research into alternative avenues of energy production via the institutions of peer review. There are also other claimed means of suppression, which include buying the patent of the free energy device from the inventor or his family, suing the inventor or patent holder, 
and even murdering the inventors of free energy devices or associated efficiency technologies. This conspiracy theory goes back uh, to at least the 1930s, when Thomas Henry Morey claimed that he and his family had been threatened and shot at on several occasions, and his lab ransacked to stop his claimed free energy research and public demonstrations. No evidence has been provided for any of these claims, so I'm just sharing with you what I've read online, but I can tell you that they're facts. Um, the American TV show Mythbusters has ex examined some claimed free energy sources. All of the trite methods failed. Several other reports uh, have been exposed as hoax and scams. Uh, conspiracy advocates claim these represent attempted suppression. However, governments have not imprisoned individuals for research concerning solar cells, geothermal energy production, nor have they closed down research centers investing, um, investigating such topics. The United States government, the European Union, and the Japanese have invested some amount of resources in developing alternative sources of energy, typically with the goal of gaining energy independence and a competitive market um, edge. So the usual claimed justification for alleged suppression is to maintain the current economic system. But from an economic perspective, the existence of free goods contradicts the idea that free or very cheap energy would destroy a market economy. Air and water, for example, necessary raw materials in many processes are available to anyone at no cost except transport and storage. Also, if energy were in fact free, then there would still be charges for costs of delivering that energy to the end user in conventional transmission lines. In many parts of the world, water is free in the sense that anyone can pull it out of a river, purify it and deliver it. However, water still has profit potential. Moreover, um, according to established economic theories, significantly lowered energy costs would result in increased economic growth since the cost of production, um, since the cost of producing goods and services would drop. Free energy would produce a fast-growing economy and enable huge economic growth. Increased economic growth from lowered energy costs has in occurred before. Raw material and resource commodities, notably coal, aluminum, textile and labor, dropped in price as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Generally, when a resource becomes cheap, other economic sectors absorb the loss or new demands will be created. This was part of the analysis on that website I mentioned um, and their reasoning behind why free energy would not be bad for the economy, um, as well as some insight on why governments or corporations or specific industries would not want it. I really feel like their argument about free energy kind of makes sense. I mean, if air and water are free, why is energy not? In the end of the day, if we've sort of evolved into this society that depends on technology so much, then energy is one way or another essential to us. Just think about it. If we were to go one day without power, how would your day be? Uh, I mean, specifically here in Miami, Every year we're dreading the hurricane season, not so much because of the destructions. I feel like people are pretty confident about that here, but more so because nobody wants to lose power and stay without power for a week or two. Um, so there's definitely some thought behind that. Of, oh, again, I can't tell you if they are, in fact, any alternative sources that could produce free energy 
I'm rooting for sure for the extraterrestrial one. <laughs> but if there was, if or if there were several alternative resources, I could definitely see why some, you know, co uh, countries, you know, not necessarily governments, but also corporations could have interest in silencing them. And I could also see how they could go about silencing them because obviously, like this article mentioned, if um, patents are being bought out, if research is being restricted, I mean, who's going to discover it, right? Who's going to work on, on developing it? So definitely some food for thought there. Between 2001 and 2002, Gary McKinnon carried out what he uh what has been described as being the biggest ever military computer hack in history when he gained access to 97 computer systems belonging to the United States military and other government bodies claiming to have seen designs for free energy devices specifically zero point energy devices and other potentially beneficial technologies again no evidence for his claim has been provided. So, what do you think about it? Do you believe that the government or big corporations are hiding the source of free energy from us? I mean, I feel like there may be something to it. If you install solar panels and still have to connect to the grid then I feel like something is a little bit wrong. Why can you not live off the grid if you want, if, you know, if you wish to, if you have the money to invest in it, if that's what you desire, why do you need to connect back to the grid? It's, it kind of creates this false illusion that you are doing good by using solar panels when in fact you're getting the same dirty energy everyone else is. You know, it's a mix of, of energy that flows into the grid. I feel like renewable sources are definitely the future and definitely need to be explored further. But we need to keep in mind that there are technological limitations as to how good we can be with the environment, even with renewable resources. And if you think about it, it also makes perfect sense that free energy would probably come from some sort of renewable uh, resources right because they wouldn't require the expense uh, you know the, the expenses that non-renewable energy sources carry they renew themselves so <laughs> i don't know like always i leave it up to you to decide what you think i just present different kinds of ideas to you and you know i always say challenge your own beliefs I'm not here to tell you what's true and what's fake. I'm just opening, you know, your mind and my own mind for some possibilities out there. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I gave you so much information to process today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I definitely enjoyed researching all of that, just finding out how, you know, our ancestors went about energy and producing electricity learning how you know we are doing it nowadays i feel like we don't really think about it it's one of those things that just it turns on the light bulbs in our in our house you know like it turns on our tv but how does it get to your house i feel like we forget to ask that question how and i really hope i was able to give you some insight to that with this episode and also some food for thought on you know how we go about renewable resources and just because we label something as green we still need to research it and make sure that in fact it is green um i feel like sometimes we're being played with those fancy words net net carbon and and for example like it sounds so fancy it sounds so good but there's always a catch there right well um, I think this is all for today. We've talked about energy quite a bit. So I'm very eager to hear your opinion. So definitely check out my Instagram page. Leave me a comment, DM me. I could feature your opinion on my story as well. 
I would love to hear back from you um, and just see what you think about it. But definitely stay tuned for next week's episode, which I'm for sure not going to disappear this time. And there's definitely going to be an episode. We're going to talk about good news again. Look at that. We're about to start a new month once again. This year has been crazy. Has been, you know, it's it's already basically gone. We're already in 2021 at this point. <laughs> so stay tuned for the good news next week. And... I'll see y'all then. Bye.